so our next speaker is Kerry Cooper. He's an assistant professor of food safety and epidemiology in the School of Animal and Comparative Biomedical Sciences. And I will open your presentation. All right, good morning. Uh, so uh, my research lab focuses on food safety, which although I'm heavily biased, I feel is, is a classic One Health kind of model uh, in that it deals with all three aspects. Um, so my lab in particular uses genomics very heavily to address food safety issues. So uh, I'm gonna cover just kind of one of the a study that we've done using genomics to address this, uh, but we have a lot of other uh, examples of it too. So, so this, so to give a little background, um, the FDA created a number of years ago a system called Genome Tracker with the idea that they go out and they collect samples from all over the country and then they sequence these, um, doing whole genome sequencing to build this giant database of foodborne pathogens. Uh, built on the principle that in most cases, the foodborne pathogens kind of maintain in one area. So then if there's a clinical outbreak, um, these get sequenced by the CDC, they check this database and they can say, oh, look, this matches a strain or is very similar to a strain seen in California. So then they can quickly zero in on California and potentially even, oh, this is coming from cattle or it's coming from fresh produce or something along those lines uh, and quickly narrow it down. Because obviously when you're dealing with the amount of food that generated in the United States on a daily basis, it's very difficult to track back on these. So they're trying to speed this up as quick as possible. So this was a project that we said, okay, that's, that's a great system, but what happens if you identify these and then it doesn't cause an outbreak for 25, 30 years down the road? So thinking long-term with this, what is it gonna look like if it's been sitting out in these environments or cycling through these environments, accruing potentially mutations so how, how different is that going to look over a time period so that we can help them build this system and address these issues? Um, so looking at this, so the goal was to kind of determine the mutation rates of these different pathogens in different environments. In particular, this was funded through the Centers for Produce Safety, so we were focused on the produce industry uh, and looking. So it's already been mentioned. This was funded actually just right before the 2018 outbreak. Um, but cattle has been mentioned, the CAFO or concentrated animal feed operation contaminated um, the irrigation water that was then used to irrigate the crops and also the soil. And so this was a prime example of how this moves around through these different systems, eventually getting into the leafy greens and the romaine lettuce and being consumed by people. So that was kind of the principle was, okay, what's happening if it's moving through these different environments or if it's just sitting out there for long-term and not really doing anything in these environments? How's that gonna vary between the mutation rates? So we looked at three different major pathogens uh, for foodborne pathogens, E. coli O157, of course, being the big one, because at the time that we started this study had just started that 2018 outbreak. But we also looked at salmonella and also listeria, which are two other major pathogens for the produce industry. Um, we looked at two different environments. So soil, obviously, for the produce industry and the irrigation water. Uh, and then we also had a control group to kind of see what happens uh, in this case, it was buffered peptone water, which is a, a media that we commonly use for isolating or, or helping recover some of these pathogens from these different environments. So we looked at two different geospatial locations, uh, Salinas, California, and Yuma, Arizona. It's already been mentioned about Yuma, Arizona. Well, Salinas is, outside of the wintertime, the salad bowl of America is the nickname for it. So it's where, when you're not growing in, in Yuma, you're typically growing in Salinas, California. So. Um, and so we decided to set this up and we basically did this for an entire year. We set up these microcosms in plant growth chambers, which allowed us to control the temperature, the humidity, the amount of sunlight that these different environments would get. Um, and so we did inoculate with a very high level, much higher than you're gonna see naturally, with the idea that we wanted a giant pool of these pathogens to kind of detect the mutations and how they move in different directions, evolutionary as they're sitting in these environments or cycling between. So we either kept them in that environment and just sampled them every two weeks, or every two weeks we would sample them, recover them, and then re-inoculate them into a new environment, either moving from soil to soil or moving soil water, soil water, kind of going back and forth between these environments. So uh, I know there's a lot on here. I'm just gonna kind of touch on some of the points. Uh, one of the things, the goal originally was not to look at the survivability, but it kind of quickly became 
something that was interesting from our study. Uh, in particular, the good news for the folks growing in Yuma was that the pathogens wouldn't survive very long under the temperatures um, of the Yuma growing conditions until we got into the heavy winter time, which unfortunately is when they're growing it, then there was a higher risk, although it still didn't survive nearly as well as it did in Salinas. So we actually have a new study that started in January that was funded by the Arizona Department of Ag to look at some of these aspects. Um, so it did survive. Um, so it wouldn't survive up to two weeks, basically in the Yuma growing temperatures until we got to those winter times, then it would survive for about a month before it died. In California or under the Salinas conditions, we found that, Salina, that Salmonella would survive 12 to 16 weeks, depending on the environment. 0157 actually survived the full 42 weeks. So we didn't quite make it to the 52 weeks because of the current fund we've been going through the last couple of years and the pandemic interfering. But we did run it out to 42 weeks. Salmonella or 0157 actually survived in irrigation water for that entire time. Um, it survived for 26 weeks in the soil. Uh, Listeria uh, survived for 10 weeks in the soil and for 16 weeks in the irrigation water. So again, this wasn't the target, but it was kind of something interesting, like I said, that we saw that it wasn't surviving very well in Yuma. And so now we're kind of looking into some of those aspects with it. Um, so looking at the mutation rate, starting with Salinas, we didn't find any mutations in those that it was just long-term storage. So it, it, it suggests that these pathogens are just sitting out there if they're not actively replicating or they're not actually growing in these environments they're not gonna obviously accrue mutations because that's only gonna occur when they're actively growing. Compare that to when we cycle them through different environments, then we did start to accrue some mutations. So 0157, depending on the different environments and how it's cycled, um, we saw up to three mutations over this 42 week period. So again, if you think of that as 42 weeks expanded out to even just considering that a year, you're looking at every year it's accruing potentially up to three mutations. So after 25 years, that's gonna be a large difference in these pathogens that could impact the use of genome tracker and tracking some of these, because in most cases, they're, they're still trying to figure out the number of mutations you need in order to say, include in a, in a outbreak surveillance, but they, you know, generally it's, it's down to around 20 mutations or so. Uh, Salmonella had up to two mutations, again, depending on the environment, and Listeria was actually the one that mutated the most with up to five mutations, again, depending on the cycling. So it really showed that the cycling and moving between the environments and having to have that growth cycle in between, in this case, it was on artificial media, but we kind of consider it moving into the animal because that's where it's gonna be happy, a lot of these pathogens, uh, and can replicate in those hosts and then be re-inoculated into the environment has the role of potentially inducing these mutations. So in Yuma, again, no mutations long-term. We saw significantly less mutations because of course it also was not surviving very well. So we did get 0157 having one mutation when it was cycling through the soil, uh, salmonella for a couple of mutations, again, depending on the environment, and listeria was up to three mutations that occurred in these different environments when cycling, uh, in, at least in the control groups. So the other thing, so what we did to, uh, to do this was we inoculated these environments, and then we did shotgun metagenomics, so we just sequenced everything that was in this microcosm. So this also allowed us to look at the microbiome of these different environments and to see is there an impact of the pathogens on these different on these microbiomes of these environments? And so here you can see an irrigation water uh, on the far left, I guess it's your left, uh, the control group. That's what it looked like um, going in. Then you can see salmonella and listeria. Unfortunately, E. coli didn't survive in this, so we didn't have this for E. coli. But you can see the salmonella has quite a bit of shift when it comes to the microbiome of this irrigation water. Listeria has a little bit of a shift, but not as significant as the salmonella, suggesting that when salmonella is introduced in this irrigation water, there is a major shift in the microbiome of that irrigation water that could or could not have an impact on food safety, and we're investigating that now. Compare that to the soil microbiome. So in this case, I don't know if you can read it, but the, the initial soil is all the way on the left. Two weeks into the study is the soil in the next column. And then, because that's the time point that we, we sampled for these different. So E. coli 0157 is the middle group there. And you can see there that there's quite a bit of shift in the microbiome in the soil when 0157 is introduced. So again, this is one of the things we're actually, with that project that just got funded, looking at what impact does the microbiome have on the survivability of 0157 and what impact does it have on changing that microbiome that could potentially impact plant health, 
but also food safety. Salmonella and listeria, although they did cause some minor shifts in being present, it was not nearly as significant as that we saw with 0157. So kind of the conclusions from this study um, was that we saw variable windows of pathogen survival uh, in the two growing regions. Uh, Yuma, there was about a five month window, which unfortunately is the heavy growing time from December to about April, uh, which is also around the time that we've seen when we've had outbreaks with Yuma. Um, Salinas, there was a bigger window of seven months. Um, and then there was even some variability before those uh, time periods uh, with survivability. No mutations in long-term survival, um, suggesting that it's, again, as I mentioned, it's not growing, but, um, or not actively replicating when it's out in these environments, um, which suggests, and how does this tie back to real world data? So recently, since the 2018 outbreak, the CDC has been, and the FDA have been monitoring out in these environments um, for these different pathogens, particularly 0157. The Yuma 2018 outbreak strain has actually been recorded causing outbreaks since that time period. It's been isolated in cattle, it's been isolated in a wide variety of different sources. It was originally actually associated the year before with recreational water in California. It's also been associated with an outbreak in a petting zoo. So it's been, it's all kind of across the West. And this course, and they've nicknamed this, or they've come up with new categories for 017, reoccurring and persistent strains. So I actually have this wrong. That should be reoccurring on there, not persistent. Uh, under the second bullet point. But so it's considered a reoccurring strain in the sense that it um, is reoccurring and causing all these problems. It also has a higher mutation rate. So as we're seeing it move around, it's accruing these mutations. So it's thus, if it's cycling through, as I mentioned, cattle, recreational water, fresh produce, it's accruing these mutations, which supports exactly what we saw in our study versus the persistent strains that strain is actually occurring in Salinas. They've been dealing with outbreaks every year with the same strain, but this strain does not accrue mutations. We don't know the source of this mutation or the source of this uh, strain other than it's leading to contamination of leafy greens every year from the Salinas, Cal California area. This would then match that that probably that strain is sitting out in that environment every once in a while. It then leads to a contamination event in Salinas. Uh, and so this is giving us some some guidance to help the FDA and other things in tracking some of these outbreaks. Um, cycling between these environments is when they get the opportunities that where there has to be some type of amplification event or growth of these pathogens, whether it's getting into an animal, 0157's natural reservoir or cattle. So when they get in there, they're much happier, they start to grow, they start to replicate, they start to accrue these mutations. Uh, you know, salmonella can also be in cattle. Listeria, not as much in cattle, but in other potential environments where it can replicate and accrue these mutations. This seems to be critical for accruing these mutations and allows us to track back using genome tracker and these other things. Um, and then the other one is that the presence of these pathogens seems to potentially alter the microbiome of these different environments, which can have major impacts on, as I mentioned, plant health, uh, and some of these other food safety issues. So this is an area that is very active research in my lab. We're doing a lot of different microbiome aspects and looking at that from a variety of different fresh produce uh, as well as other environments. So with that, I just wanna acknowledge my team that did this, my lab manager, Victoria Oberg, uh, and some of the students that were involved, as well as my collaborators at the USDA and specifically my industry partner, which is critical when working with the produce industry at Church Brothers. And with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, thank you, Terry. Um, if you have